Hello everyone, we are from group 6. My name is Grace. Today, me and my group members Chen Yi, Serena and Diana will be presenting on olfaction. From this video, we will know how to describe the structure of receptors involved in smell and the function of the olfactory system. Plus, we should be able to explain the mechanism of olfaction besides knowing how smells are registered in the olfactory system. As we all know, air flows in and out during normal breathing. The inner lining of the nose has many blood vessels at the surface. Blood flowing through your nose warms the air as you breathe it. Your nose also humidifies the air before it gets to your lungs. Other than that, the nose has many small hairs inside the nose fields. These hair act as a filter, removing dirt and particles before the air enter the lungs. Sneezing and nose blowing also help remove these particles out of your body. Besides that, smell is one of the most important functions of the nose. The sense of smell is not completely understood. Smell is a key component of memory, physical attraction, and emotional connection. Although taste is a completely separate sense than smell, the nose plays a role in the way the tongue perceives taste. The aroma of the food plays a role in the taste. Lastly, air resonating in your nose affects the sound of your voice. The shape of your septum also plays a role in the sound of your voice. As a result, Surgery on your nose may also alter the sound of your voice. For the next topic, I will pass this to Chen Yi to discuss the structure of olfactory system. Thank you, Grace. Moving on, we will be talking about the structure of the nose. Here we are covering the external nose and skeletal structure, paranasal sinuses, and also the nasal cavity. So starting with the external nose, we can see that it is in pyramidal shape. There is the root that is located superiorly and apex located inferiorly. Between the root and the apex, there are the bridge and dorsum nasi. And the ala or the ala nasi um, are the wings of the nostrils, which are laterally bounding the two nostrils, which are also called as nares. So moving to the skeletal structure, there are a total of 12 cranial bones, including the paired and unpaired bones. The paired bones, we have nasal, maxilla, palatine, and lacrimal. As for the unpaired bones, we have ethmoid, sphenoid, frontal, and vomer. So to refer to the diagram, those in red boxes are the paired bones, while the green boxes are the unpaired bones. Besides the bones, there are actually cartilage as well, which are the ala cartilage, septal cartilage, and also the lateral process of septal cartilage. The ala cartilage is separated into major alar and minor alar. As you can see in the yellow boxes here, the major alar will form the apex of the nose and the minor alar will act as a support to the ala nasi. And the arrows up there are actually pointing the septal cartilage. It's a one thin cartilage on top. And below that, we can see the lateral process of septal cartilage, which will form the dorsum of the nose. So here's a question. How can we remember all the bones and the cartilage? So we actually have this one little tip just by remembering this sentence. Nerdy medical students are often very pale and all late for school. So as you can see, nerdy medical students are often very pale are referring to the bones. Nasal, maxilla, sphenoid, boomer, palatine, lacrimal, and ethmoid. And for the all late for school, I actually referring to the cartilage, alar, lateral, and septal. So we're now done with the external nose and skeletal structure. Let's proceed to the paranasal sinuses. Paranasal sinuses are the air filled spaces in the nasal cavity. There are actually four pairs of paranasal sinuses, which are the frontal, ethmoid, sphenoid, and maxillary sinuses. As for these, we came up with this short sentence Farmer eat small McChicken, which is for the frontal, ethmoid, sphenoid, and maxillary sinuses. So, what are the functions of paranasal sinuses, you may ask? They actually help enlighten the weight of head, humidify and heat inhaled air, increase resonance of voice, support immune defense of nasal cavity, and also protect vital structures by acting as chromosomes. So let's start with the frontal sinuses. You can see them right here. There are actually two frontal sinuses in triangular shape. It's located within the frontal bone of the skull, and they are actually the most superior of the paranasal sinuses. So when it comes to drainage of the frontal sinuses, it is done by the frontal nasal duct and open up to the hydrosimilaris. 
you can actually refer to the diagram here, the frontal nasal duct, and also the hiatus semilunaris. And in this second picture right over here, you can see by referring to a diagram, there's the white arrow. So by following the white arrow in the diagram, we can see the flow of the drainage. It's starting from the frontal sinuses and through the frontal nasal duct and open out to the hiatus semilunaris. Next, there is a supraorbital nerve that we have to know. And this supraorbital nerve is actually responsible in a sensation of frontal sinuses. It is a sensory nerve that brings sensation to the upper eyelid, forehead, and also the scalp. So how do blood supply to the frontal sinuses? The so-called arterial supply is actually done via the anterior ethmoidal artery. And this is the artery that branches out from the internal carotid artery. So that's all for the frontal sinuses. Now I will pass it to Serena to continue with the rest of paranasal sinuses. Spina sinus are situated within the body of the spinoid bone. They open into the nasal cavity in an area superior posterior to the superior cocca, which is also known as spinal ethmoid recess. They are innervated by the posterior ethmoidal nerve and branches of the maxillary nerve. Spina sinus can also receive blood supply from pharyngeal branches of the maxillary arteries. Next is ethmoidal sinus. We have come out an easy way to memorize the three ethmoidal sinus which is CAMP that we have learned in biochemistry. A represents anterior which opens onto the hiatus semilunaris as we can see in the diagram the yellow area. M is middle and it opens onto the lateral wall of the middle meters and P is posterior which opens onto the lateral wall of the superior meters. Axillary sinus are the largest of the sinus that and they are located laterally and slightly inferiority to the nasal cavities. They drain into the nasal cavity at the hiatus semilunaris, which is underneath the frontal sinus opening. This pathway is a potential pathway to spread infection. Next is nasal cavity, which is the most superior part of the respiratory tract. It extends from vestibule of the nose to the nasal pharynx. They have three divisions, which can be memorized as over. O is olfactory region which is located at the apex of the nasal cavity. V is vestibule which is the area surrounding the anterior external opening to the nasal cavity. And R is respiratory region which is lined by a slated pseudostratified epithelium interspersed with mucus secreting goblet cell. Nasal concave is projecting out of the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. There are three pathways which is inferior, middle, and superior. They also have four pathways which we can memorize it as M superstar. I refers to inferior meters which is between the inferior concha and floor of the nasal cavity. M refers to middle meters which is between the inferior and middle concha. Super refers to superior meters which is between the middle and superior concha. And star refers to sphenoid ethmoidal recess which is superiorly and posteriorly to the superior concha. The function of the concave is to increase the surface area of the nasal cavity, which increases the amount of air that can come in contact with the cavity walls. Lastly is the innervation. The innervation of the nose can be functionally divided into special and general innervation. Special innervation refers to the ability of the nose to smell. This is carried out by the olfactory nerves. The olfactory bulb is part of the brain which lies on the superior surface of the cribiform plate that is above the nasal cavity. Branches of olfactory nerve run through cribiform plate to provide special sensory innervation to the nose. General sensory innervation to the septum and lateral walls is delivered by the nasopalatine nerve and the nasociliary nerve. The innervation to the external skin of the nose is supplied by the trigeminal nerve. Now, I will pass it to Diana. Thank you, Serena. Now, I'll proceed on explaining how does this sense of smell works. Air flows through all three tubes in the primary nasal cavity, but only the supermeters has smell-sensing hairs and cells. The air rushes through the nasal passages, making it difficult to detect subtle smells. The majority of air goes through the two lower passages, but the long hairs of the upper passage will slow down the air flow giving the sense sensors more time to function. When you smell something, you are actually inhaling little molecules. These molecules activate olfactory sensory neurons, which are specialized nerve cells located high inside the nose. And inside your nose, there are a few millions of these cells. 
which each produces one of around 500 distinct types of odor receptors, allowing it to catch a specific set of scent molecules. If there is a substance in the air that triggers a smell, the mucus lining at the upper passage walls will absorb it. No cells are sensitive to a variety of chemicals and are found underneath the mucus membrane. When the presence of substance molecules in the mucus lining triggers a nerve cell, it will send a signal to the brain, which the brain will then interpret as a scent. Most smells are composites combining the signals of several cells responding to various chemicals and interpreting them as a single order. Smoke, for example, may consist of hundreds of airborne pollutants, yet their combination is understood as smoke. Or, the scent of perspiration are made up of dozens of distinct components which the brain has learned to perceive as sweat. Cilia, which are hair-like structures that are sensitive to distant scent molecules, are found at the tips of olfactory cells. Each smell activates a different set of olfactory cells, resulting in a different pattern of activity. The long, extending arms of neurons called axons carry this distinctive pattern of activity to the olfactory bulb. Two olfactory bulbs, one for each nostril, receive axons from olfactory neurons. The information encoding the scent then travels to the main olfactory cortex, which is positioned on the temporal lobe's anterior surface. The olfactory information is subsequently sent to nearby brain locations where it is combined with taste information. These senses work together to form taste perception. The number and organization of neurons in olfactory bulbs can vary throughout time. Rodents and primates, including us humans, have olfactory bulbs, which are one of the few brain areas that can create new neurons throughout their life. I will now pass it on to Grace. In conclusion, Olfactory memory, due to its direct communication with your decision-making center, plays an important role in your life. Big corporations are very aware of this connection, which is why they won't hesitate to use it to trigger your primer instance and overpower your rational brain. And lastly, here are our references and online tools. Thank you for listening.